Dinosaur King is a media franchise created and owned by Sega where dinosaurs transform to and from cards and can be summoned by people to do battle with one another. There's an arcade game, a DS game, a two season anime and trading card game or TCG. Dinosaurs are categorised into one of seven elements, lightning, earth, grass, wind, fire, water or secret. In this series I'll be going through and analysing the scientific accuracy of the species within each element. In this video we're going to be looking at the wind element, home to dinosaurs that fit the vague descriptor of small to medium sized theropods, and is one of four elements that theropods are split across in the franchise, in addition to fire, water and secret. Wind move cards usually involve either powerful gusts of wind to launch at opponents to lift them into the air, or to move like the wind with insane speed to attack. In Dinosaur King, all the theropod models have a fair few universal issues that are very common errors. The first are that many are shrink-wrapped, that is, the fenestrae, the holes in the skull, being visible through the skin when they should be obscured by skin and tissue. Theropods are also thought by most researchers to have had lips. While some of the models do have lips, most of them have exposed teeth. It's very inconsistent. They all have pronated wrists when their palms would have been facing each other rather than the ground. They are restored with the correct number of toes with four, however their third toes, aka the middle weight bearing toe, are shown as being the same length as the other two weight bearing toes, but it should be longer as it bore the most weight. The final note is that many of their tails are too skinny. Theropods had large chordofemoral muscles, the muscles that were anchored to the tail that would pull the legs back for walking and running, and so they should be much thicker at the bases. The first theropod we're going to be looking at is quite a famous one, Dilophosaurus. Its name means two crested lizard and it lived in North America during the early Jurassic roughly 185 million years ago. Whilst it's most famous for its heavily inaccurate portrayal in Jurassic Park in 1993, our interpretation of the real animal also underwent a huge makeover in 2020 when its fossil material was thoroughly described for the first time since its discovery in 1940. As you can imagine, this has made the Dinosaur King model quite outdated. The signature crests are shown as separate bones erupting out of the top of the skull, whereas we now know they were actually extensions of the skull itself, and their shape is not well understood, due to them not being well preserved in any of the known skulls. Dilophosaurus had a notch in its upper jaw, and this is portrayed on the model, however it likely wouldn't have been visible in life as it would have been obscured by the lips. The head is portrayed as very lightweight, whereas it is now known to be much more robust. Likewise, the entire animal should be much more muscular, as it was an apex predator. The bones of the contemporary basal sauropodomorph, Cerasaurus, show bite marks matching the teeth of this animal. It is restored with three fingers, however, basal theropods had four fingers albeit the fourth digit was considerably smaller than the first three and vestigial. On the whole, this model is very outdated, and even for the time, the body is probably too lightly built. Not the best reconstruction of this animal, unfortunately. Up next we have Lillian Sternus. It is named after amateur paleontologist Hugo Lillienstern, and it lived in Germany during the late Triassic from roughly 228 to 208 million years ago. Whilst it is often portrayed with two head crests, similar to those of Dilophosaurus, the skull is incompletely known and so may not have had these crests. Due to being unknown, I won't critique it. Its head has been given a notch in its upper jaw, also like Dilophosaurus, however it's unknown whether this was present, as this part of the skull is unpreserved. Even if it did have one though, it likely wouldn't have been visible in life and would have been covered by lips. It's also been given only three fingers, however all known Triassic theropods had four fingers, and the fourth digit was much smaller than the first three as is typical. 
overall, not the best Lillian Sternus, but I appreciate that this animal is hard to reconstruct. Next we have Gojirasaurus. It lived in New Mexico roughly 210 million years ago. Its name means Godzilla Lizard, after the famous movie monster Godzilla, or Gojira, in Japanese. It was named for its size, as it appeared considerably larger than other Triassic theropods at an estimated 6 meters long. However, this genus is now considered dubious, as a lot of the material originally referred to it has since been reinterpreted as belonging to another Triassic reptile, Shuvosaurus, meaning it may not have been as large as was once thought. Some researchers also don't see any differences between the remaining fragmentary Gojirasaurus material from that of the more completely known contemporary Triassic theropod, Coelophysis, which strangely isn't represented in Dinosaur King in any capacity. As such, this animal is difficult to reconstruct, and so this model is mostly speculative. The skull is unknown, but the head has been reconstructed quite similarly to Dilophosaurus, with two head crests and a notch in the upper jaw, which, if present, probably wouldn't be visible in life behind the lips. The head also looks oversized in proportion to the body. Whilst the hands are unknown, it has been given three fingers, but most likely would have had four, like other Triassic theropods. As this genus may not even be valid due to its fragmentary nature, it is almost impossible to judge its accuracy. But based on what we know about other Triassic theropods, it's not great. Up next we have my personal favourite dinosaur, Ceratosaurus. Its name means horned lizard, and it lived in North America, and possibly also Europe and Africa, during the late Jurassic from 153 to 148 million years ago. This probably represents C. nasicornis, as it's the best known species. The distinct three-horned skull is reconstructed wonderfully here. It's possible the pair of crests over the eyes would be more brightly coloured like the nasal horn for display purposes or species recognition, but this may have only been in males and is only speculative anyway. It has the distinct row of osteoderms running the length of the spine, known from the fossil material which is excellent. It has the correct number of fingers with four, however the fourth finger shouldn't have a claw. The legs look to be too long. Ceratosaurus had proportionally short legs and was probably a poor runner. As such, it is thought to have ambushed prey rather than run it down. The overall body should be more heavily built too, as it is portrayed as very scrawny and athletic. On the whole, it's not the best Ceratosaurus I've seen, but it's not bad. We now come to a family of theropods known as the Abelosaurids. This group is split across two elements for some reason, as some genera are also in the fire element. Regardless, all those in the wind element live during the late Cretaceous. This group is famous for their short skulls and tiny, backwards pointing arms with four fingers. Whilst the Dinosaur King models usually have the correct number of fingers, they often have four claws, when only the first three should have them. Many of them also have the more standard arm posture for theropods, which is incorrect. The first Abelosaurid we're going to be looking at is Rugops. It lived in Africa roughly 95 million years ago. Its name means wrinkle face, and fittingly, this model seems to have a lot of caruncular flesh on its brow ridges, similar to a chicken or turkey for example, which I think is a really cool speculative detail. Only the skull is known for this animal, but it's said to be 9 meters long in Dinosaur King, which is significantly longer than estimates for the real animal, which are closer to 4 meters. Rugops is one of the very few Abelosaurs in the franchise to be incorrectly restored with only three fingers for some reason. It's also been given hugely muscular legs, even though basal Abelosaurs like Rugops are typically restored with more gracile legs. So this model has both highs and lows, which overall makes it decent. Up next we have the most famous Abelosaurid, Carnotaurus, aka Ace from the anime. It lived in Argentina roughly 70 million years ago. Its name means meat bull, after its distinct bull-like horns. 
The head appears quite severely shrink-wrapped. However, the skull has been practically perfectly reconstructed. I say practically, as it's difficult to determine what the famous horns would have looked like in life, based on the bony cores. Here they are shown as pointing upwards at roughly 45 degree angles from the top of the head. Other reconstructions I've seen have them curving downwards, but this still feels perfectly plausible to me. We actually have skin impressions from Carnotaurus, and they show it was covered in tuberculate scales, which is reconstructed here. It is commonly depicted with a row of osteoderms running the length of its spine as seen here, similar to Ceratosaurus. However, there is no evidence for this, but I suppose suppose it's not impossible it had it in life. The legs are appropriately long, as it was thought to have been a very fast runner. However, the feet are weirdly huge for some reason. The general issue of theropods in Dinosaur King not having thick enough tail bases goes double for Carnotaurus. The vertebrae in Carnotaurus's tail, whilst in most theropods they form a vague lowercase t, or plus shape, the transverse processes, the horizontal projections on vertebrae, form huge Vs to accommodate enormous chordofemoral muscles to power its legs. This is somewhat reconstructed here, but it could still be thicker. On the whole, Ace is a pretty solid representation of Carnotaurus. Next we have Majungasaurus. Its name means Mahajanga lizard after the region of Madagascar where it was found in rock dated to the end of the Cretaceous 70 to 66 million years ago. This genus was named in 1955 based solely on some isolated teeth and jaw bones. A small domed bone was also found separately but was referred to a new genus, Majungatholus. It wasn't until the 90s and 2000s when much more complete skeletons were found and it was discovered that the dome was in fact part of the same animal as the teeth and jaw bones. Due to being coined first, the name Majungasaurus took priority, making Majungatholus a synonym and therefore invalid. Due to the timing of the discoveries of highly complete skeletons in the 2000s, the Dinosaur King model was likely made in between discoveries, making it perfect in some ways, but outdated in others. The head has been perfectly reconstructed with its distinct stubby horn on top. However, the legs seem to be too long, as Majungasaurus had quite short and stubby legs compared to many Ablosaurs. Whilst it has the incorrect arm position and elongated legs, it's pretty good. The last wind Ablosaurid is Indosuchus. It lived in India at the end of the Cretaceous 66 million years ago. Fittingly, its name means Indian Crocodile. However, it may be synonymous with its contemporary fellow Ablosaur, Indosaurus. However, all fossil material referred to that genus has sadly been lost. Despite only being known from parts of the skull, this is probably the most accurate Ablosaur in the franchise, as not only does the skull look correct based on other, more complete genera, the arms correctly point backwards, even if the wrists still seem to be pronated. The body proportions also look very plausible too, though it should now probably have shorter legs akin to Majungasaurus, but this is assuming it is more closely related to it, based on biogeography from the proximity of India and Madagascar during the late Cretaceous. I'm not sure why Indosuchus was given such special treatment, but it looks fantastic. Now we have a very enigmatic genus, Delta Dromius. Its name means Delta Runner, as it appeared to have long and slender legs for its size. It lived in Africa during the late Cretaceous, roughly 95 million years ago. This genus is very fragmentary, and might be synonymous with fellow North African theropod, Bahariosaurus, which itself is fragmentary and may be dubious. Its position on the theropod family tree has shifted many times since it was distinguished from Bahariosaurus in 1996. The most recent studies have found it to most likely be a member of the Noasaurids, close relatives of the Ablosaurids. As you can imagine, it is extremely difficult to reconstruct this animal. Here it appears very similar to Allosaurus, who we'll talk about later, perhaps because it was once thought to be closely related to it. 
If it should be reconstructed as a noosaurid, however, they had wildly different proportions, with much smaller heads on long necks, with a very gracile torso and limbs. It does have the long legs that are known about the animal, at least. I don't think I can properly critique this model, as the genus it's based on is just too poorly understood as of now. Now we've reached the Tetanoran theropods, whose name means stiff tail, after the bony caudal rods that, well, stiffened their tails. They also ancestrally had three fingers, which are represented in the models, with one exception which we'll get to. Often cited as the basalmost Tetanoran, we have Monolophosaurus. It lived in China during the mid to late Jurassic, roughly 165 million years ago. Its name means single crested lizard, after the, well, single large crest running from over its eyes to the end of its snout, which is perfectly reconstructed here, as is the entire animal. It's possible the crest had more elaborate soft tissues decorating it in life for use in display or species recognition, but this is only speculation. Otherwise though, this model is essentially perfect for the time. Up next we have Eustreptospondylus, the first member of the Megalosaurids, the only theropod family in the franchise to be split across three elements, wind, fire and secret. It lived in England during the late Jurassic, roughly 160 million years ago. It has a slightly complicated taxonomic history. It was first referred to the genus Megalosaurus in 1890, like most large theropods were at the time. In 1964, it was referred to its own genus, Eustreptospondylus, meaning true reversed vertebrae, and was named as such to differentiate it from the dubious genus Streptospondylus, that was referred to a single theropod vertebrae found in England in 1842 that has since been lost. That aside, Eustreptospondylus is only known from an incomplete juvenile skeleton and an ilium from another individual. As such, it's worth noting that an adult animal may have looked different to the only known fossil material. Megalosaurids are now known to have had quite long heads, and this model appears to be too short. It does, however, have the small crest correctly placed above the eyes, though they might be too tall based on the fossil skull, but it's possible they were larger in life. The arms on this model are really long for some reason, much longer than they should be. The legs might also be slightly too long for a megalosaur. On the whole, this model is a bit dated and out of proportion for Eustreptospondylus, but it's not bad. Next we have the second wind megalosaurid, Afroveneta. Its name means African Hunter, as it lived in Niger during the Middle Jurassic, roughly 165 million years ago. In essence, it's basically the exact same story as the Eustreptospondylus. The head should now be slightly longer, and the arms and legs should be shorter. It comes out ahead of the Eustreptospondylus though, as its crest looked to be the correct size. Overall, it's pretty good, just also outdated. Next we have a very interesting theropod, Piatnitskisaurus. It lived in Argentina during the early Jurassic, 178 million years ago. It was named after paleontologist Alejandro Piatnitsky. Its position within Tetanurans has shifted many times, but it is consistently found to be close to the base of the tree, close to megalosaurids. The skull is incompletely known, and most museum mounts give it a very round skull, reminiscent of Abelosaurids, when it's now thought to be longer, quite similar to Allosaurus. Speaking of, it is often reconstructed with similar head crests over the eyes, however this part of the skull is unknown, so it's impossible to say whether Piatnitskisaurus itself had them. This animal also has an interesting issue in that it has too many fingers. It's been given four when it should only have three. The rest of the body looks correct to me though. On the whole, this isn't the best reconstruction of this animal, but it could be a lot worse too. Up next we have a very famous genus, Allosaurus. Its name means different lizard and it lived in North America, Europe and possibly also Africa during the late Jurassic from 155 to 145 million years ago. 
This is one of the very few genera in the franchise to have multiple species present as separate models. Two models, definitively referred to Allosaurus, are in the wind element, and the fire element has a potential synonym in the form of Saurophaganax, but it's still debated whether it was its own distinct genus from Allosaurus. There are three confidently known species of Allosaurus, A. fragilis, A. gematsenae, and A. europaeus. Interestingly, the model referred to as the type species, A. fragilis, may be based on fossil material now referred to the newer species named in 2020, A. gematsenae. The body genuinely looks fantastic for this genus. The head appears to have a more gradual slope towards the tip, which is reminiscent of A. gematsenae, compared to the steeper drop-off of A. fragilis. The only issue I can see is that the middle finger seems to have a much larger claw, when the largest claw was actually on the first finger. This model is fantastic, and still holds up to this day, aside from the general theropod issues of course. I actually think it's one of the best reconstructions I've seen of the animal in paleomedia. As for the other species, confusingly, a Aatrox is no longer a valid species, and has since been synonymized with A. fragilis. So the model labelled A. fragilis is now probably A. gematsenae, and the one not labelled as A. fragilis now is. Whilst this model does have the correct snout shape for A. fragilis, its crests are quite small and low, when they should probably be slightly taller. Otherwise though, both models are amazing representations of Allosaurus. Up next we have Synraptor, the first member of the family Metriacanthosauridae. Its name means Chinese Snatcher, and unsurprisingly, it lived in China during the late Jurassic, roughly 160 million years ago. Some researchers see it as synonymous with the fellow Metriacanthosaurid genus Yangchuanosaurus, which is in the fire element for whatever reason. Regardless, they are very similar and closely related. The model looks essentially perfect. The two low crests on its skull are perfectly reconstructed, as is the entire creature. Next we have a very odd genus, Szechuanosaurus. It is named after the Szechuan province of China where it was discovered, in rock dated to the middle to late Jurassic, roughly 165 to 160 million years ago. It is considered a dubious genus, as the name was originally assigned to theropod teeth in 1942, which are non-diagnostic for a genus name by modern standards. In 1983, a partial skeleton was referred to the species S. campi, and a second skeleton was referred to S. zigongensis in 1993. However, in 2012, these were both referred to the genus Yangchuanosaurus, the former to the type species Yangchuanosaurus shanghuensis, and the latter as a new species, Y. zigongensis. As such, I think the best thing to do here is to assume that the model labelled Yangchuanosaurus represents the type species Y. shanghuensis, and to judge the Szechuanosaurus model as Y. zigongensis. The head seems to reflect the skull's gradual sloping towards the end of the snout, as well as its two crests. It has a strange row of tall spines down its back. I don't know what that's about, or how reasonable they are, but they're plausible I guess. Shockingly, it's actually a really good reconstruction on the whole, assuming it is YZ Gongensis that is. I was very surprised by that. Next we have Neovenator. Its name means New Hunter, and it lived in Europe during the early Cretaceous, roughly 125 million years ago. This model's head is very strange. It has a single ridge along the midline of the snout, when most reconstructions I've seen have two separate ridges that start very close together at the tip of the snout and connect to the bony crest just in front of the eyes. The tip of the snout also seems too blunt when it should more gently slope off. It's also especially shrink-wrapped for some reason. It should probably be more heavily built too, especially the arms. On the whole, it ends up not really looking much like Neovenator. The next genus we have is Utah Raptor. Its name means Utah Caesar, as it was discovered in the US state of the same name in rock data to the early Cretaceous, roughly 135 million years ago. 
It was the largest of the dromaeosaurids, the very bird-like family of theropods commonly called raptors, which had sickle claws on the second toe. The head appears to be based on the outdated reconstruction of the skull of its relative, Deinonychus, that was much taller and sloping than more modern reconstructions. Utah Raptor, however, had a short, blunt head very different to what is seen here. It also lacks feather covering. Whilst we don't have any evidence of feathers for Utah Raptor specifically, using phylogenetic bracketing, i.e. guessing based on information from its closest relatives, we can reasonably assume that because other dromaeosaurs are known to have had feathers, unless there's evidence to the contrary, Utah Raptor most likely had feathers too. By modern standards, it should have full, penaceous feathers everywhere but the lower legs, with the forelimbs essentially forming wings, though not for flight. It does have some long, strand-like filaments on the back of its head. No idea how plausible that is, but it's definitely unique. What's so strange is that other bird-like theropods in the franchise have full coats of feathers, but Utah Raptor doesn't for some reason. Utah Raptor was also a very heavily built dromaeosaur, and this model looks too gracile overall. It's not a very good Utah Raptor reconstruction, neither by modern standards or for the time. Next we have a fascinating genus, Megaraptor. It lived in Argentina during the late Cretaceous, roughly 90 million years ago. The name Megaraptor means Big Caesar, and was named as such in 1998, as it was thought to be a huge dromaeosaurid. Its discoverers assigned it to this group as it had an enormous recurved claw, a signature of this family. However, in 2007, it was found not to be on the foot like those of dromaeosaurs, but to be on the hand. In 2010, it was placed into a newly named lineage of theropods entirely, the Megaraptorans, whose placement within the theropod family tree is in flux. Because these discoveries were made during the production of Dinosaur King's various incarnations, Megaraptor was reconstructed as a giant dromaeosaur with the huge recurved claw on the foot. The head looks to be based on Deinonychus, but we now know Megaraptorans had more triangular skulls in profile. It also has a feather mane on the back of its head, and partway down the midline of the back. For the time, this was a reasonable reconstruction, however, it is now very outdated. The second Megaraptoran, and the last wind dinosaur, is Fuquiraptor. Its name means Fukui Caesar, after the Fukui prefecture in Japan where it was discovered. It too was initially classified as a dromaeosaurid in 2000, but was eventually reinterpreted as a Megaraptoran. Unlike Megaraptor, the Fukui Raptor is reconstructed much more like our current understanding of Megaraptorans. The only issue I can see is that the huge claw has been placed on the second finger when it should be on the first. Otherwise though, the model looks superb. Dinosaur King's wind element is the one that seems to be the most poor in terms of accuracy for the main six. It feels as though many of the models, especially the more basal theropods, were just given very generic, copy-pasted body models, which don't really reflect their biology. It's incredibly inconsistent too, and I feel more care was needed when making these models, as some feel like they were more meticulously designed, whereas others feel rushed, and it ends up as a big mess where accuracy is concerned. Many of their issues aren't just due to newer discoveries though. A lot were problematic at the time, and are even more so now. It's a shame, and I do wish more care was taken with these guys, as they're some of my favourites. I'd like to thank my good friend, The Cobra Effect, and recommend you check out my friend and fellow Paleo YouTuber, The Casual Prince Ace, and his videos on Dinosaur King if you're a fan. Thank you guys so much for watching, and please do check out my other videos and subscribe, as it helps a ton. Bye bye now.